Bhagavato Sambhutvasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhutvasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhutvasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So now, if anybody is here that didn't get the um, the printouts for this whole series, they need to let Bonte know because we're up to part three. We first, this is the fourth meeting. We had one in the beginning that was we read the Siegel of Sutta for you but then decided later we wanted to do an in-depth explanation of each section of the sutta. So this time we're going to be talking about the friend section. Of the One sutta. thing about the documents is that whenever we are uploading the videos uh, in the descriptions, I keep, give a link uh, to the documents also. So you can download the documents from the uh, YouTube talks. So this talk, uh, this uh, document will be there on the YouTube description, there will be a link. So anytime uh, they need documents which they have missed for the previous talk, they can get it in the descriptions. That's okay. really good. Oh, that's good. Okay. So hello, everybody. And um, we start out, I'm going to, I'm not sure if you guys got it right away and you're going to try and follow it, or I'm thinking I'll put it up on the share screen for you if you want. Um, Bhante, I have a question. Did it, whoops. If I put it on the share screen, um, then what happens is, um, do they see me or do they see the document? Only the doc uh, doc uh, your uh, document they will see. Okay. Uh, only so, the document. They can okay, see well, the, uh, 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 you, there will be a small uh, image of you on the corner, very small. Oh, okay. All right. Do do how? So where is everybody? Yes. And do you? Okay, <laughs> I can't see anybody but you. But uh, anybody here? Do you? I need to know whether you want to follow the document on the share screen or whether you want me to just go over the document and you see me like this. So, how many of you want to see it on the share screen while we go through it? We need a vote here, so I need to have you wave to us or say something on the chat, <laughs> okay? Uh -huh. I think you make the decision. <laughs> I get to make the decision. Do you know I have to tell you all a secret for 14 years, let me see, 13, 12, 13 years. I didn't make any decisions at all. I just followed ins instructions and um, everyone else was making decisions. And then since I came overseas, a lot of times people ask me to make decisions and I'm there, huh, what, what? <laughs> I have to make a decision. So it's like karmically interesting how I have to learn all over again how to make decisions. So I'm, I'm just gonna, use my document and if anyone wants to see it just wave and i'll put it on the screen okay uh, they are putting out on the chat yeah. they are saying share it share it there are three votes for sharing it there's what on the chat they have uh, put in uh, three votes for sharing uh, the document oh to, so they can see it okay well then i'm going to put it up it's just very simple here we go here you go and then let me see, I put this over here. And um, how do I get that to take the whole screen, I wonder? No, I guess I, I don't, okay. Okay, so web view, what we're gonna do- In view, web view. Sorry? In view, web view. View. I can't, I can't find it on the, your screen yeah. sharing. Uh, next to he help, huh? Review help in between that there is a view option. Oh, yeah. And now uh, web, we go to um, maybe the the on the right hand oh, sorry left hand side web uh, layout or something like that. 
try that huh is that better yeah or is that making it smaller is that nice like that that's pretty good yeah, okay huh. okay we'll do it this way okay so we're just going to go through these and and um then we're going to talk about what we've run into ourselves and how this works can you identify what's going on with the advice that the buddha was giving us he starts out by explaining false friends so we first look at false friends and true friends and the first section is false friends in the sutta so those the false friends are those who take first of all they take whatever they can get they give little but ask for much. They do what is required only out of obligation. They are friends for their own advantage. The next group is those who pay lip service. They claim to have been good friends in the past. They promise to be good friends in the future. They try to gain favor with kind but empty words. And when called upon, they say they are unable to help. Those who flatter, they approve of wrongdoing. They approve or disapprove of doing the right, whichever will benefit them. They speak well of you in your presence. Ill of you others when not well. You slander and God basically. Those who will bring ruin, they are companions by indulging in drinking. They are companions for being out late at night for no good reason. They are companions for excessively frequenting places of entertainment. They are companions for indulging in gambling. So in summary, friends who take, the friends who pay lip service, the friends who flatter, the friends who bring ruin. Those are the groups that we go through in identifying those people who give us the most trouble in life. And the Buddha is basically setting you up to identify them by very clearly stating what to look for in these people. True friends, those who are helpmates, they protect you when you are vulnerable. They protect your possessions when you are vulnerable. They are there when you are troubled. They provide generosity and ge generously to you when there is a need. Those who remain in the same, in good times and in bad times. They trust you with their secrets and they can be trusted with your secrets. They do not abandon you in times of trouble. They may even give their life for you. those who give good counsel. They restrain you from doing wrong. They encourage you to do what is right. They keep you informed of what you should know. They show the right way and are companions for spiritual practice. 
those who are compassionate, they sympathize in your misfortune. They rejoice in your good fortune. They restrain others from speaking ill of you. They commend those who speak well of you. In summary, the friends who help, the friends who stay in good times and in bad, friends who give good counsel, the friends who are compassionate, the wise will know that these four are truly friends and treasure them as the mother or father does their only dear child. Now to the Buddha, friendship is the single most important factor determining the direction of a person's life. The right kind of friends can help, even the most wayward of friends can help, even the most wayward person to change for the better. Whereas the wrong kind of friends can bring down even the most upright person. Good friends, especially spiritual friends, can lead each other to the greatest of heights to reach your potential in your meditation, your practice at home and in life. And the Buddha pointed out that we become like those we befriend. And if we unmindfully associate with false friends, our decline can come about very rapidly indeed. So bad company should be avoided unless we are there in times of need or to help them improve themselves. So the true friends are rare and should thus be treasured is the whole nutshell version of this. Now, next time what we're gonna be doing is protecting the relationships and talking about the qualities of success for the average person and for leadership in a country. So that's a pretty interesting one too. But all tying this together made for a very long, uh, very long period. And so I wanted to just check with all of you and see what kind of stories you have of, can you relate to what the Buddha was saying? Because I find it very accurate and very much in a nutshell. So jump in and contribute a story <laughs> or contribute what you think about this. Some people think the Buddha never <laughs> declared anything about anybody. And also some people have the idea that the, uh, the whole song had never has, have, has a problem. It's like, we're not human, you know, <laughs> we're something else. And in essence, the truth is we're human beings and we have robes and we take vows and we try to do the best we can the way that you would in any other occupation to be the best that you could at what you do. But the susceptibility in life of going off track is so prevalent today. So prevalent. We're being pushed around and drowned digitally. That's one of my favorite things right now. It's, it's, it's a remarkable thing. Someone called me last week and says, I don't know what to do. And I said, what's wrong? He says, I haven't got anything to do. And I said, watch a movie. She went, no, no, I can't watch a movie. Why can't you watch a movie? Did you ever look at Netflix and see what's on there anymore? This is a great time. 
my gosh. And then I'm, I'm overseas, I'm not in the United States. And when I look at what's happening here in film is very different. And I want to say as an American, oh, Bollywood, please come to America. <laughs> it's real life, but it's also happiness and something is there to lift you up. But in America, if you don't have a gun in your hip and a gun in your chest and a gun on your back and one in your leg and a knife in your other leg, there's something wrong with the movie. <laughs> you no, know, everybody's fighting all the time. But Bollywood, you know, Bollywood, even the Bollywood, I have to tell you, I cannot remember the name of this movie. One of you can help me to remember maybe. Someone took me to see a, a movie because I wanted to understand um, Pakistan. And they took me to see a movie. And this movie was made uh, about a family that got separated in the separating states of Pakistan, East and West Pakistan. And of course, this is a very serious documentary almost style movie. And it's a drama and it's got wonderful characters in it. You learn a lot about suffering. And you learn a lot about the solution of the suffering. You learn a lot about the ability to handle it when it's really coming down strong. And it's a long, over a long period of time. But what was interesting about this movie was Bollywood made it. And there's in Bollywood, the thing about it is there is a, there is a recipe. I don't know if you know about this, but there's a recipe to make the movie work. And it means there has to be drama. There has to be a story. It has to tear at your guts and make you cry and make you laugh and then make you dance. And this movie, because of what it was, and they made it, you uh, were in the theater, I think, and you saw the whole movie and then it stops and they show you some about the end of the story, but, but wait, don't get up and walk out because the last part of the recipe everybody's going to dance. <laughs> and then they're celebrating because the family got back together again. And I thought this is what movies are supposed to do for people. This is what is supposed to be happening. Where is India when you really need them? They need to come to America right now. <laughs> That's a reasonability, you know? But this thing about the different kind of people, how does this touch you that the Buddha was so clear about this? And he psychologically has a lot to say. I mean, uh, last week we had a discussion with some monks and uh, that uh, happens once every two weeks. And I pointed out to them that there was almost 30 or 40 suttas about psychology in the, in the Buddhist texts. And nobody was mentioning this. So I had this, uh, I do have a PowerPoint presentation gives you the name of all the suttas that have to do with psychology. And we say Buddhology, <laughs> Buddhology, yeah. And the approach and the approach here is a preventative pr approach to psychological problems. I think you would agree. It's a preventive approach to psychological problems to learn to let it go. Never mind it, let it go, relax, smile and come back. And if you train yourself to have that as a habit, then no matter what is happening to you, no matter what you're dealing with, you don't have to, when the friend is not a good friend, like in the one part of the, uh, the one part of that, it said basically near the end, I think it was um, in the explanation, bad company should be avoided unless we are there in times of need. Okay, the mud came the other day and washed a whole place, a whole town, tore it all apart. And when that happens, people are in need. So even the guy who was drunk on the street or couldn't get rid of the habit of drugs or was living alone and was angry at the whole world and everybody on that block needs a helping hand. That's when everybody needs compassion. Everybody needs patience and everybody needs um, an extension cord. <laughs> 
so that they can fix the water pump, right. Okay, no, everybody needs to let go of taking things personally. I don't care if this man yelled at you last week. I don't care if he went to your car or you locked your bike over, but it still works. I, I don't care. When there's a disaster, nobody needs to care about that kind of stuff, but helping each other survive. That's what I think this part of the world has a better handle on than some other parts of the world. And I think that the probably the place you have the most problem is the more things that you possess as possessions, the harder it is for people to just get along and help each other when there's a time of crisis, they fall into a protective mode instead of just really trying to make sure everybody has what they need to survive. So that's a, careful. So what do you all think? I can, um, I guess I could tell you a story. I'm, I'm not sure if I told this story before, but um, you, you all should oh, let me see you and nod your heads if I already told you. Um, a long time ago was uh, actually, let's see, this is 2021. This would have been in 2005, maybe. We were just going on to the land at Damasuka on the mountain. And uh, Bhante needed to go to California to do some retreats. And so we were getting ready to go, but there was a problem because we needed someone to take care of a couple cats and a dog and actually mind the property while we were gone. And uh, there was a man that was nearby. And the man uh, was known to have taken care of people's houses before. So we let this man come and take care of the house while we were gone. Now we were gone for some time. It was like about a month's time to go. And uh, he was the only one on the property. At that time, there, weren't, there wasn't only one side of the property was developed. There were no roads to take care of. There wasn't a lot of uh, fussing about buildings and stuff like that. They weren't there yet. <laughs> and anyway, what happened is we come back after about a month or a month and a half of, of, you know, traveling around and doing different retreats and talks all over the country. And when we got back, well, there was a little bit of a problem. Okay, just a little bit of a problem. Uh, at first, it was everything was okay, uh, because I had gotten him a really nice uh, reclining seat where he could sleep and stay warm by the fire. Uh, in this very small A-frame part of the house and he could shut himself in there. He would be toasty warm and it was just himself and he lived nearby. So we thought everything would be fine. And I got him blankets, just everything. So he was nice and warm. And um, so while we, while we were gone, uh, about a month passed, we got a phone bill. And um, the phone bill, <laughs> The phone, the first one, I think the first one was something like $11,000. And it was like, how can the phone be $11,000? It must be some mistake. And I started investigating. And it seems that this person was very lonely and very, uh, you know, distraught and probably partially, uh, you know, he wasn't retarded at all. He was a real hard worker. And he would follow instructions to, you know, repair a roof and repair a barn and things like that and do jobs uh, but um this was quite serious <laughs> you know eleven thousand dollars because we didn't have eleven thousand dollars our phone bill was about thirty dollars or forty dollars a month maybe maybe that much yeah and so um upon investigating it we found out that the phone calls were uh, to talk to people uh for fortunes and to talk to like lonely hearts 
type talking to people. And um, then, you know, he didn't realize he had done anything wrong. This is honestly, when you looked at his face and said, do you know this has happened? The person didn't even realize this. So this was a person that you don't want to be around and you don't want to be involved with actually, but actually at the same time, this is a person who's in trouble. This is what this was about, a person who was really in trouble. Now the second phone bill came and then it went up the rest of the way. And this was from the other companies that sent the bills at a different time of month. And the eventual bill came up into the level of like $21,000. Yeah. And so this was quite serious because the, you know, upon calling the companies, the response was, well, you have to pay. It was on your phone, you have to pay. And then finally, when I took it up to the, I just very patiently took it up a bracket, up a step, up a step and got to the top of the ladder in this thing. It, the deal was if you, madam, are willing to take this man and convict him in court, we are willing to drop the price off of this thing if you'll convict him. And of course they thought for sure, I wouldn't do that. And I went to Bonte and uh, he can't do that. You know, at that time I was not a nun and I could do that. And so I did, we, we decided we had to have him arrested. This is a very sticky situation because this means that for the first time in my life, I'm in a position where if I don't take this person to put him in jail, and it was getting cold too, that's the other thing, it was cold when we came back, it was only like February and it was very cold. And they, they arrested him and they put him in jail and then my heart just went, this man is in jail. And you know, I couldn't believe this man is in jail and the jail's a cold place, it's not really a nice place at all. And the story goes on to the fact that he had to eventually go to court a seven month period where he stayed and lived at the jail. Actually, after the story is over, he would tell you it was a really good deal. He was at the jail. They were a small town, a jail, and they let him out to go and do his grocery shopping and come regular simple meals that were served at the jail and he had a roof over his head and we didn't realize what was going on until the court case. Now, when this court case happens, I am not allowed to speak to this person at all. So we are called into court to watch this thing happen. And then we're watching, I'm watching what's happening to him and he gets somebody to represent him who is doing pro bono, free you know pro bono work as a, a young attorney who's never been in court before so why is it so upsetting about that part is that he had two felonies that were not serious felonies but they were felonies and in this the state if you get another felony you go to jail for like an extended period of time you don't get to come out unless there's some kind of circumstances so i'm wondering what is this guy going to do with this client when he's never been in there before and i'm beginning to understand this man is has a mental problem needs to have a, an investigation into what really happened why was he on the phone like that and then as we're getting into this uh, I heard that they were going to do one thing and I said, this is just not right because I had worked in mental health before and I, I wanted to talk to the judge and I got to talk to the judge. I said, here's the problem is this man needs a welfare evaluation. We went to see where, when they did the welfare evaluation, we went to see where was he living nearby us before he did this crime. And the place that he was living was in between like four or five little trees like this with plastic, a rope and then some plastic over it, black plastic. And inside was a very small, tiny wood stove. And nearby was a creek where he could wash or he could go to the bathroom or he could, uh, you know, he could get his water upstream. This is a pathetic situation we didn't even know about. We were trusting the neighbors who used him before to think he was okay. 
So upon meeting with the judge and saying, there really needs to be a welfare investigation. And he looked at the situation and said, there has to be. And then they looked at everything. It turns out he had been working at a sawmill. He had two hernias, one here and one down below. Very painful. And he wasn't getting steady work anymore when he came to where we were. And he was very lonely, very, very lonely. And he was just talking to people on the phone. So it ends up that he gets convicted and we don't have to pay the money. We went along with that. And then they gave him a place to live. They took him to the hospital. They paid for his hernias to be repaired. Uh, he ends up with a small place to live and a small job to start out as he's getting rehabilitated. He gets time uh, to count for the time he was in jail, which was seven months off the seven years that he got for the crime. We don't have to pay, so we were able to keep the center, the land, and all of it went away. And I can't help but think it went away because we worked so hard to make sure it happened fairly. There must have been something in the universe that was working for him, but it was working for us because it's a very hard thing to take somebody, even though they're not a dangerous person, you know, like that. But even when they've done a crime and they've done it against you like that, it's a very difficult thing even then to take that person, put them in jail and think, they're in lockdown. And I think in the future, people are gonna think about what it's like to be in lockdown because so many of us have been in lockdown for such a long time now, you know? So all of this came out differently than we all thought it would come out in the end. Yes. So we did what we could do without endangering ourselves and just looked at it as a human being. And in the end, he came out rehabilitated very well because he ended up meeting the woman who was on the phone. That was the best part. And she comes across three states and meets him and gets to live where he's living. It's like a storybook thing, you know? But I can never say hello to him again. <laughs> and eventually he moves out, he moves away. I think he went to Tennessee later on, he moved away. But these are some of the things that happen, you know, it's it that happen in life, and you're not quite sure what to do. But I was taking a lead, basically a faith, a, a jump in faith, because some things had happened to Bonte in the past, um, you know, where he just kept sending loving kindness and kept sending good things and compassion and not looking at it as everything is happening to us. At first, it was very hard to consider, but that's the way we had to handle it. And that's what happened. So is there power in loving kindness? Is there power in compassion when you're dealing with people? How far are you supposed to go anyway? You know? And uh, that's what uh, this is about. Yeah, Ulysses. Yeah, I, I mean, I was reading the text and then listening to you, and um, this this text is very interesting because when you live in New York City, one one thing that is is a very common experience to most people who live here is that is that um, uh, we don't live with our families. Everybody here is coming to like make career, you know, somehow, and we depend heavily on our friends to be our our family support, basically, right? And so because of that, it's so very easy to either um, find friends for all these different things that are listed in here. And sometimes some of these actually come together, the good, and the good, the, the good, the bad and the ugly, <laughs> they all come together. And, and so I think this is where, where the wisdom, you know, of, um, of understanding, you know, you know, what, um, I guess a, a wholesome life comes into play because you need to be able to to understand the gray areas for all these things, you know. And for example, mm -hmm. I was just reading um, in here, for example, 
friends who bring ruin, you know, like for example, their companions for indulging in drinking, uh, their companions that being the like being out late and for no good reason. This is so New York, by the way. <laughs> uh, then, for example, there are companions who, uh, for exclusively fre frequenting places for entertainment, again, New York, you can check that out as well. And then um, uh, there are companions for indulging in gambling. That's not necessarily New York, but people do like to play like table games and things like that. So, you know, like this is this is something that 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 it's, it's, interest, it's an interesting list to consider because you have to understand when it is wholesome and then when it becomes an unwholesome situation. You know, when you are, when you find yourself, for example, in companion of people who are, who cannot meet in any other uh, situation, but in a bar, for example, or in a drinking situation. So you have to like really like start, you know, uh, understanding when is it when it becomes bad habits, when it becomes destructive. And then, of course, like all the parts in here where it talks about when it's good, of course, you know, we all identify with that. But especially in big cities and when you are living, you know, with younger people sometimes or, or you're single and you're away from your families, these are things that are really good to watch out for. So that's that's what I wanted to say. And then you have to be uh, wise, wise enough to know when you have to pull away and, and do it in a compassionate way because we sometimes don't understand why people sometimes resort to these things you know it, it, it you have to be compassionate and you have to like not be snobbish at the time when you say no i'm sorry i'm not gonna go i'm not gonna i'm not gonna meet you guys today or whatever you know you have to have the compassion to to do it in a, in a way that is uplifting that you're not leaving them down feeling like you know that, that, that you don't want to frequent them anymore just because they the only thing they want to do is drink you just say no i'm sorry tomorrow i have to say tomorrow i have yeah. to work tomorrow i have to do what i have to do and you and you have to apply your wisdom to that and your compassion because it's it's not just about just avoiding people that may be potentially dangerous obviously there are some situations in here like the buddha is really clear you know uh the, the lip service you have to that's just common sense you know you have to begin to see if people are just paying your lip service obviously this is not a friend to keep you know or people who just yeah. flatter you or people who we just take and take and take and take it. That's another thing. Like sometimes we can be so compassionate with people, and then we allow people to take and take and take it. And suddenly we're, you know, we're we're having issues. But it's again, it's balance, right? It's the middle way. It's finding that middle way. Absolutely, it's true. It's very true. I have, you know, a, 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 um, yeah, Prajati. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, she just came in. Um, yeah, it's absolutely true. Um, I think of one thing that I've seen happen in Buddhism sometimes is not studying carefully the Sigalavada Sutta. Sometimes we can get a very warped version of what uh, we think the Buddha is saying and what we should and shouldn't do. In modern times especially, um, there's an extreme version of this where you watch a person who's almost willing to just lie down and be a rug and let the other person just walk all over them. And that's not acceptable. It's not, not the Buddhist path to allow someone to do that to you. And um, there was a situation in one country where I was, where a friend had a piece of property and it was next to another person's property. And the other person was a kind of a very, very wealthy, rich person. And the property next to the to the house that he built, um, the friend that I know, uh, they they had a blank lot, a vacant lot, and and this uh, this the person who built this place, he actually um, assumed that if he when he built that place, if he drained his uh, gray water, not the not the sewer, not the septic water, but the gray water from baths and everything and washing. That if he he set up his pipes when he built that house, so it would run out onto their property, onto that property. Now her father died, and when he died, he was afraid that she would have trouble with this, and it's been going on for over eight years now. And and it's 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 a very it's a sad situation because the situation is one where a lay person believes that no matter what they shouldn't do anything mean to the person who is totally completely abusing them and abusing the law and getting away with it and doing hurtful things to the person and their family 
and they think no matter what, I shouldn't do anything to to defend myself. So this, this is very sad. So they 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 made it so the water was draining there, and then they had the the, the person that built that house. They they called the police and they basically said this person is going is causing an endangerment for dengue fever in this neighborhood because there's a puddle on their property and wanted to have the person arrested who owned the property and eventually lose the property so he could take it and build a bigger house and the reason uh, i would say that is because when i saw pictures i saw how the house is right against the boundary of her property right here and the door that he built is on to stepping onto her property. There's no space between the two properties. He violated everything he could violate to do this. And this has been going on for years. She, and the, she's paid attorneys and the attorneys have, they bit the dust and anybody who uh, was trying to help her out of it built the dust and the story goes on and on. And I have said to her, you know, this is a case of let it go. It's a piece of property, just let it go give him the property she should give it to him at this point give it to him for christmas because the the law is not going to protect her and the community is not going to protect her and the government's not going to protect her and all the laws in place they just don't work for her in this situation she's lost all this weight she's lost her job lost her living through this whole thing it's incredible so we have to be careful when we say love one another, love everyone and turn the other cheek that we don't find ourselves lying on the ground on a, on a rug, allowing somebody to just walk all over us. That's not what this is about. It's not Buddhist to do that. So this is one thing that's crummy, you know, is taking the, uh, taking the, that idea as, as it, as what it means. Yeah. Whoops. Okay. Okay. So anyway, so that was a kind of rough story in that situation. It still is not, it's still not over. But anytime you ask me about that, it's like, it's time to, uh, <laughs> it's, I have all kinds of solutions, but I don't know. I, I one night I told, you know, it's a very American thing, but I said, you know, the best thing to do is mix up some cement and plug up the pipe so it can't drain and then have him tell them that he didn't put the pipe there and you have to be absolutely quiet because the whole house would back up. And she won't do anything like that, though. And I said, it's your property. How can you not do it? <laughs> As a farmer, that's exactly what one farmer would do to the other farmer. <laughs> Just back it up. And you can't deny you're doing it when you back it up. But anyway, I don't know what will happen. But I do know that's not the right, uh, the right way of, of handling this. And she's tried to be so nice, so nice. <laughs> and nothing works. So, so this whole thing with the different types of people, you see the good people, um, there are good stories here too of friends who are really true friends who will stay with you even in troubled times. And I actually, one of the best friends I ever had before I was a nun was um, my neighbor in Washington, DC where we actually never met each other. We were working different shifts. And then suddenly there's a, you know, a wall between this apartment having a, a balcony on the first floor and this one having a, a porch on the first floor. And somebody was crying at the table over here and I was crying at the table over there. <laughs> and that's how we basically peeked around the corner at the same moment and said, let's go get ice cream <laughs> and talk about it and see what's really rough in life and what we can figure out. That's an old, a long time ago story. But that person, we would stand by each other no matter what through anything. We were not related. We were not a couple. We were not anything like that. We were just friends going through a similar adventure in life and sharing and listening is the gift that you can give um, to someone to help more than anything and taking turns listening to each other when you're trying to work something out uh, in relationships. Um, there is a, 
formula for doing it that's really terrific using the Four Noble Truths kind of to do this. Or if you know somebody and you can't talk to them and have anything productive come out of it, and you want to iron out the differences, the first thing you ask the person is what is going well? Now it's your turn and you have 20 minutes and the other person has 20 minutes. So the first question is, what is going really well? And you just listen to them, listen to them talk. And the next question is, what is tough right now? What's tough for you right now? Then you just talk and you listen to them, but you can't criticize them. You can't say that's silly or that's dumb or anything or put anything they say down, just let them talk. And then the next one is, what do you think the cause of that is? And you let them talk about it, whether no matter what they say, it's just talk, just listen to it. And then the last part is, well, what are you going to do about this now? And this could be a friend who's having a tough time at work or a, in a relationship working something out like that. And the last one is, uh, what, are, what are you planning on doing about this? And then the final piece is you say, what can I do to support you while, this, while you're doing this? What do you need as support? And a lot of times they'll say, I just need to, I need to bounce this off someone. Can I bounce it off you here and there? Yes. That's what you want for yourself and also to give the other person is a board, a sounding board. That's all. Just a sounding board is such an incredible gift to give another human being. And then you take a turn and that's it. And when you do this with someone, you make an agreement not to bring up what they were talking about or anything, unless you ask permission to bring it up later, because maybe they don't want to talk about it again, you know, but if you have an idea later, you could talk to them later about a suggestion. You could, if it's permissible to, you know, to add to the pot of ideas, you know, add to the, to the basket of ideas of how to solve it, but don't go in thinking that you can fix the other person. As soon as we believe that we can help the other person by fixing them, we fail. As soon as we believe we're going to save the other person, it's not going to work. But being able to point to the way of them being able to help themselves, that's the best way to come out of this thing and help the other person. Yeah. Any other ideas, contributions? Are we going to call it tonight, Sarah? You, you have anything? Ulysses. Oh, I see Ulysses is there. Okay. So this was the lesson, and it's oh, brought brought it here. So what kind of people are the worst? Are are the the hardest ones to help are as totally estranged from you. What do you think the most difficult kind is? <laughs> you know, it's like I'm back in Sri Lanka. <laughs> I'll tell you this one last story before we go, but I don't know how to get questions in this one. I really don't. But I'll tell you a funny story. The way to become wise is to question things constantly. I mean constantly. And when we go into a society where the society, now a lot of you aren't from India, but a couple of you are here, but a few of you are here from India. But OK, but a lot of times in the culture, Questions is not an option in elementary school, sometimes up to high school time. And so in the modern world, in the developing nations, they want to hire people. This is where I was a human resources specialist before. They want to hire people that are going to ask questions constantly. 
to make their job, particularly their little job or big job, whatever it is, better than it's ever been better before. They're seeking people that are asking questions about, they wanna hire the person who is going to not ask what the company can do for them, but they're gonna ask what you can do for this company if I hire you. They're the ones that they wanna hire, why? And the reason for it is innovation. And how do you get people to be innovative to make it work better than it ever has before for the company as you hire a person who is constantly asking questions? Yeah. One time I got a job and I asked the doctor at the hospital, why did he hire me? He could have hired a registered nurse to set up a cancer registry in that hospital. He could have hired a scientist who applied for the job for the same rate of money to do her PhD thesis and open up that cancer registrar. And why did that uh, doctor hire me? I asked him. <laughs> because you wore a beautiful orange skirt and you asked a lot of questions. That's all he said to me. And then what did he do to me? He knew I had a really eager mind. How did he make me able to set up that cancer registrar at that hospital? How did I do that? He sent me to the University of Massachusetts and put me into audit and anatomy class. And then he sent me to um, another college to do medical terminology. I aced it. I just aced it. I loved it. And then he he spent his days having lunch with me during the week for at least two months where he would bring a book. He'd say, read this and tomorrow we'll talk about it at lunch. And it was breast cancer and arm cancer and bone cancer and all that stuff. And we're going through all these cancers. I mean, these people were really fascinating people, you know, remarkable people. The pathologist, what a hoot. He was really something. <laughs> He came out to my office once for lunch and we hardly ever talked. I talked to him sometimes about a case uh, that was, uh, I didn't understand it in a, in a document and was filling it out for the registry, uh, but I didn't really get to see him very often. And one day he came out, you know, and he had a clear bottle like this and he put it on my desk and he said, there. And I said, what there? And he said, it's a Ewing's tumor. I said, okay. <laughs> and he, he said, no, in this bottle is a Ewing's tumor. And I'll never forget this. He was so proud of this because he was there when they took this out of this man. And there's only 200 of these that happen in the country every 10 or 20 years. Nobody gets to see a Ewing's tumor. And then I said, do you want to go to lunch? <laughs> I mean, this was his world to find this, but he was a constant questioner. He used to talk to me about questions. Who are the people who are going to go out and change the world when they get hired at a company? The ones who ask the questions. And what happened? I think in the countries where the dear beloved British were, <laughs> or the Dutch, or the Portuguese, is that the people were told not to ask questions, just to do what they were told. And somehow that's gotten the genes of people. So when I was in Sri Lanka, okay, I had a friend. I was teaching a simple, basic foundations meditation class at a university for about six months. And she was teaching statistics at the master's level, statistics she was teaching at the other university. And we used to have lunch. And I told her what my problem was. I could never get them to answer questions. And I knew they had a lot of questions. And she had the same problem in master's degree statistics. So every time I said, okay, hey. came lunch one day. I walked and she said, I have done it. And I said, what have you done? 
I've done it. I know how to get them to answer, ask questions. I said, tell me, tell me how to do it. And she reached in her bag and she pulled out like a bunch of, of five by seven cards. I said, what is this? She said, those are the questions. I said, what do you mean those are the questions? She said, I give them to them as they come in the door. And if they'll stand up and ask the question before the end of the class, I'll give them points. I said, ah, oh, that doesn't count. <laughs> You can't give them the questions. They have to ask the questions. Come on. So you guys, you need to think of questions. If I need to give you the papers for the, I'll give you the ones for next week. I will give them to you early. I will give them to you Tuesday. So you have them for Wednesday because next week is really good um, topics. These topics are provoking these topics are provocative the one is about protecting relationships and then the other one is called um the qualities for success and the qualities for sex success are for successful individuals and the qualities for successful leaders doesn't matter if they're leading in your university or your corporation or where, but what makes the most productive thing go on in your organization? If the leader, how is the leader? What are the qualities of the leader? Think about everything that you've learned and come back and let's talk about this next week. And I will bring duct tape. <laughs> because I'm feeling time now, but you have to raise your hand. I have a question, okay? See the question? To get knowledge is to you ask. You just ask the question now. Oh yeah, Ulysses, go for it. <laughs> Hi, no, it's, uh, I mean, I'm trying to formulate the question, but it's more about a comment about um, those who may pay lip service and those who flatter. And I think, um, I mean, I think I know the answer to this too. It's, I mean, everything is is set in there, but um, sometimes, again, talking about the experience of living away from family, you know, because when whenever you you are living close to family, you know that those are the people that you're going to be reached out. Hopefully, you know, if, if you're in good in in good relationship with them, or if you can trust them, like I trust my family back home. You know, I can always talk to them. I can always seek seek to them for counsel. But when you rely on friends. Um, in a city, for example, and, and I'm, I'm assuming that Mumbai is a big city too, and some people can relate to this experience of relying on, on friends. Um, it, it's it's important to, I think it's important to also um, understand how you how you show up to your friends. You know what what are you putting out that you're bringing in these friends. Does that make sense? When when I talk about people who pay lip service or people who flatter, um, are you that kind of person yourself to a certain extent that you are attracting people like that to you as well, um, as opposed to somebody who who who's really clear about what you know what ba ba bound boundaries you will step on and which ones you will not, because you want to be able to attract people who who will be who would be um, true to you like just like it says in here like they're true friends right the people who will be there always for you that will do no matter what but i think a lot of it has to do with what are you projecting that you're also getting back in terms of friendships so i, I just wanted yeah. to point that in there and i don't know exactly how to formulate a question but um maybe there are other suitors that can support that this this idea of of what you project is also what you what you get back this is karma that's your karma. See what go what 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 goes around comes around. What you put out, you get back. So you're actually talking about karma. See, the place we get lost in karma when we talk about in Buddhism, the the place you get lost is thinking, well, the karma we need to be concerned with is the 
what happened back there when another other lifetimes and it's coming to bother us in this lifetime the place we should be more concerned is what kind of karma are we making inside this present time when we're living in the present time and we're moving along are we putting out what we're putting out is what is going to come back to us you see and that's exactly what you're talking about yeah you think so yeah 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 so karma actually is meaning we forget just means action and the the action is the way we look at people and express ourselves with our bodies and body language it's speech okay and it's actions, mind, speech, actions, and you know what you see, how we how we work with that. And I think cutting people off, you know, so they couldn't be around people so much was just a devastating thing for mental health and everything has been a devastating thing with COVID-19. That the whole world has experienced this is is really traumatic. You know, in Malaysia, it's still very, very bad over there. It's not on the verge of opening. It's really, really in a tough situation over there. But I also think that, you know, when when we are in this practice of Buddhism, where we are learning to um, be by ourselves in meditation, you know, I think that we learn to cope better with um, loneliness. And we become a little more choosy about the people that we, we frequent. And even the, 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 and the and also the the way that we conduct ourselves, I think it, it already tells people, oh, this is not one to be messed around with. You know what I mean? So so you begin to then uh, slowly attract people to your life that are more in kin with your energy. They are not gonna, you know, they, yeah. they are not going to destroy your energy. They are not gonna destroy who you are because they That's already right. know who people who might, you know, they know that you are contented with yourself they know that you don't really need other people to make you happy you are making yourself mm -hmm. happy that's right so yeah. so so they're not going to come and bother you then other people might want to see why you're so happy and what's it what's all about you or why is it that you are so serene and tranquil right they they want to they want that as well but there will be other people who are just so involved in their own problems they're not going to even bother you so but i think this is important to 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 especially when we live in in big cities and we depend on having friends you know to 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 be truthful to our practice i think mm -hmm. because then that forms the person that we're projecting and then that also informs people the people that can be you know uh, and again this is not a matter of judgment like it's not it's not that it's not that you're judging other people but it's just that you are becoming the the person who who you want to be but also you're attracting people to your life that are more in kin and then whoever else is not going to be part of that then that's 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 their journey and you just yeah. you move along and if they come to you for help then that's a different issue i don't know that's i'm bubbling up right now yeah but that's true i mean it's a it's absolutely true it works that way yeah it does loneliness is an interesting thing because to be alone is one thing but loneliness is another thing just always remember that part so when we say, when we go into Buddhism, we don't, um, actually we step away from loneliness, <laughs> but we find we enjoy being alone. I think the more we get into it, the deeper it goes, we're not disturbed by loneliness. So loneliness is a condition, but um, being alone is something that a lot of people never get a taste of. And being alone and finding out who am I exactly? Do you remember we talked about uh, forgiveness and we talked about the um, the affirmations you were using in forgiveness and things when people practice that way. One of the most uh, revealing ones for some people, um, where they a lot of times if they had a stage mother or somebody who wanted them to be an attorney or a pianist or something who was hovering all through life. Uh, helping them to be the best they possibly could be. And they wanted to please the parent, but the child never got a chance to breathe. And then as an adult, all of a sudden they turn around and they find out, I forgive myself for not ever allowing myself to just be. 
And then that's incredible. Some people will just cry buckets because it taps in to something they never realized. They never had any time to be at all. They were working so hard to get on a track they were put on to accomplish, accomplish, accomplish that they never had a chance to turn around and smell the roses, so to speak, or take their shoes off and just say, I don't need to get to that place right now. I can go down, put my feet in the ocean or sit down and just drip castles for a while by the sand, you know? This is what that's about. If we've been in a job or we've been in a position training for something, um, the best thing you can possibly do once you get that final degree is take about three to six months off and breathe and then go and do that job and you will find out there's a difference in your approach and you're freer about it. But if you never take time to breathe ever, what happens? The person Sometimes it comes out in anger. You know, I, I was fooling around with artists for about five years, four or five years. We I wanted to see the art they were already making. And when they were finished the retreat, I wanted them to send me information the following month what color are you using now what is the texture what are you doing what is the medium you see what i'm doing and it changed and one of them was a very famous artist carlos i can't remember his last name is you know he's from uh colombia his studios in colombia south america but also on the west coast of the united states and his art changed how did his art change it became open the Sculpture, he did three dimensional paintings that were like four feet by eight feet, six feet, 12 feet for great big corporations and things like that. The artwork was three dimensional with pieces of, um, he actually went to, um, uh, you would say, I guess, um, solid waste centers <laughs> where they have machinery that's old and take the pieces and build this piece of art on the canvas and then paint it. And then it was representative though, all the art that was happening was representative of how they were living there and, and what was going on in the government and what was going on with the drug cartels and different things that were going on, all, all, all of it, you know? And all of it completely changed. Because why? Because he spent time by himself and because he opened his mind and the opening of the mind, that experience of opening the mind changes everything. It changes the depth. It changes the geometric, you know, contours of what you can do. Even if you're not an artist, this can change for you. If you, you used to try to do our work and all of a sudden you could never make it balance or anything, it'll change. I think what you're saying in there about, um, and, you, and you mentioned the, the uh, the forgiveness meditation on just being, you know, for, uh, forgive myself for not just being. I mean, I think this is really true for anybody who's, who has experienced being in a very concentrated career. I mean, I'm a musician and I know what that's like because, you know, basically what teachers tell you is like, if you, if you stop practicing, something is going to go wrong with your technique and something's going to go wrong with your whatever. I think this is true for a lot of careers and people feel like just taking time off from the practice of your craft that this that is somehow is going to be detrimental, but there is also truth in the in the fact that people sometimes just need to do something completely different and separate, and smell the roses, you know, go to the beach, go to the mountain, go to something, and really be, you know, just put aside everything that was your concern. So you, like you said, open the mind to yeah. to other things, and then then your art, whatever. In my case, being an artist, but I think this is also true for people in other careers that are that are so performance based. That, that that then you can start seeing, oh, there is also this other color. There are also these other smells. There's other, other, also this, other sounds. 
we're just so focused on doing the same, the same ones, the same ones all the time because we believe that that's what the technique and practice is all about. When you're a classical musician, you don't listen to jazz, or you don't listen to pop, or you don't listen to anything. But but it, it is usually the, the the innovative artists that that take time to be away from the from whatever they were doing before that it, they, they say, oh, this is really cool too, you know. Oh, this is really interesting too. Yeah. And then you begin to see other possibilities. Then you then you go back to your your classical music, and it's like. There is another way of playing this too to make it alive, to make it fresh, to make it new. And I think this is probably also true for a lot of performance-based careers, even I think for doctors, you know, people who are who who are studying medicine and sometimes we're oh, just yeah. we're just stuck just stuck in one way of thinking about how to solve these health problems. You step away from it, you come back, there is something new. That's right. It's one of the reasons we need to be sharing more. Um, Ayurvedically with allopathic and homeopathic and everything need to be meeting at a table to look at all the possibilities of things. I mean, see what I've found since I've been here is going to an Ayurvedic doctor is, is really uh, putting me back together gradually. But going to the allopathic doctors, it didn't work at all. And, and the, uh, it, the, the, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mesh, I guess, with the way that I believed but open, op, being open, it didn't, it didn't work as well to, to progressively see how everything could, could heal by opening up, opening up and surrendering to, to the way this method of, of the way he works with the body and he works with the mind and everything like that. This is kind of interesting to do this, you know? So it's very, very different approach, but you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. When we take a breather, from the pressure we're under, if we're in school or that, or if we are, you know, really take a breather, then we come back and reset. It's like restarting the computer. It's like that, restarting the computer, turn it off and restart it. Yeah, exactly. So are we okay with this? Are we ready for next time? Are we okay, Bonte? Yes, uh, is there any other person who wants a question? Uh, Kushal? Yeah, uh, hi, Namaste Bante, Vandami Namaste. Bante, Vandami, Vandami sister. Uh, I don't have any questions actually. I'm uh, so now the, uh, I don't know his uh, sir's name, he's the music composer, right? We are from the yes, creative yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, we are from the creative field. You are getting my voice? Yes, yes. Now, yeah, same was with me. I will tell it that is personal about me. I used to see everything as an uh, one thing only in one direction. This should be right. This should be go this way only. Other thing is not in this means creative field as an actor. You're getting my point. This is bad thing. This is good thing. These are uh, not correct things and all that things. I used to see in the same manner to the all the projects, even music. Or dramas, theaters, films, and anything which I used to watch. But nowadays, I'm feeling that uh, that my uh, vision of seeing this has completely changed as a positivity. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I think everyone is uh, working, everyone is hardworking behind every project. There are good things or bad things to be happen in every project. But mere thing is that they are hardworking. Everyone is hardworking. And I don't now feel any bad thing in that. I think everything is good in the project. <laughs> uh, when we come to talk, I say, yeah, it's okay. I'm not a critic, but uh, it's okay. I found it very well. Good, good thing to uh, enjoy. Good uh, thing for an entertainment. Means the total. Uh, way of seeing to any object has been changed due to this uh, meditation. I am. Uh, I said uh, uh, once when uh, uh, Sister Kema asked me. So I said that uh, when the retreat was there at Mumbai University, that retreat has changed my vision of seeing towards anybody, any object, create uh, creature, living or non-living or everything which is present in this nature or in this universe. Uh, that was That's I want right. to say. Yeah, that was I want to say. Very good, Sadhu. Thank you, Sadhu. Very good, Sadhu. I do. 
this is an interesting um, thing opening up and uh, I've been reading uh, some books uh, that I was uh, given originally in 2012 and now I'm pulling them out again and looking at them totally differently you know and 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 reading these uh, books about the different types of Buddhism that were developing in the period of the uh, Theravada getting going and everything and um, how everything was uh, evolving during the time after the Buddha was gone. And, um, and some of the things I'm reading are spectacular now. I think, wow, look at that. that. That's what's happening now. When we're practicing, we are opening up. And how did you open? The way you opened was to step back, not try to make anything happen. But it turns out the way to the opening is to step away and stop handling letting go of all of the tension, all of the tightness and relaxing and smiling and turning it into a game. What, what as adults, you know, when we get involved, I don't care if it, I've been in theater, I've been performing, I know what you are both talking about. And, you know, I, I don't um, uh, get to a place in my life where nothing, nothing, I don't have any fear about going and talking to God or the president and or anybody. If you want me to go and talk with him, I'll talk with him. It's okay, you know, because there isn't anything that can happen that's going to surprise anymore, you see. And so at this point, when you feel this way, how did that happen? Was by letting go and finding out you could survive with Empty, 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 emptier, 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 emptier. Relaxing and letting go and smiling and coming back. And your smiling lifts you up and your loving kindness and your compassion and the joy you feel inside when you feel good. That's what's keeping you going, yeah? And that's what we want you to experience. And that's what they were writing about in these books. They were writing about it, but back then I didn't understand it. I, did, I thought there was something had to be done and people come and they still think there's so much I have to make it happen. No, you want to make it happen, it won't happen. You want it, you can't have it. But if you allow it, it will blossom because it's in all of us to be able to have that open up and that discovery of the different, uh, the colors, the sounds, the smells, the tastes, everything. That's what you're wanting to experience. So where are you asking for when you're asking for that, yeah? What you are asking for is a newborn brain. <laughs> the newborns, if you want to know how you want to feel, you go to the nursery school, ask them if you can just watch. Yeah, the children are so excited and they're so loving and they want to know and they're so curious and they're happy to find out and discover, discover, discover. That's where I want you. When you sit like that, just watch and see what happens next and keep going, Kushal, you're doing good, keep going. And that's why you look around your whole world like that. It starts to change. Keep feeding that. That's good. So we, Thank should, you, sister. we should we should close now. We did really well. So next week I feed you material for thinking and questioning sooner. Okay, <laughs> I promise. Okay, let us close now. We will close the session. Yeah. Let me see what I have here. Here it is, okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and birth Devas and Nagas, mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.